The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton, read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter Twenty. Of course we must dine with Mrs. Carfrey, dearest, Archer said, and his wife looked at him with an anxious frown across the monumental Britannia ware of their lodging house breakfast table. In all the rainy desert of autumnal London. There were only two people, whom the Newland archers knew, and those two they had sedulously avoided, in conformity with the old New York tradition, that it was not dignified, to force oneself on the notice of one's acquaintances in foreign countries. Mrs. Archer and Janey, in the course of their visits to Europe. Had so unflinchingly lived up to this principle, and met the friendly advances of their fellow travellers with an air of such impenetrable reserve, that they had almost achieved the record of never having exchanged a word with a foreigner, other than those employed in hotels and railway stations. Their own compatriots, save those previously known or properly accredited. They treated with an even more pronounced disdain, so that, unless they ran across a Chivers, a Dagonet, or a Mingott, their months abroad were spent in an unbroken tête-à-tête. -tête. But the utmost precautions are sometimes unavailing, and one night at Botson, one of the two English ladies in the room across the passage, whose names, dress. And social situation were already intimately known to Janey, had knocked on the door, and asked if Mrs. Archer had a bottle of liniment. The other lady, the intruder's sister, Mrs. Carfrey, had been seized with a sudden attack of bronchitis, and Mrs. Archer, who never travelled without a complete family pharmacy, was fortunately able to produce the required remedy. Mrs. Carfrey was very ill, and as she and her sister Miss Harley were traveling alone, they were profoundly grateful to the Archer ladies, who supplied them with ingenious comforts and whose efficient maid helped to nurse the invalid back to health. When the Archers left Botson, they had no idea of ever seeing Mrs. Carfrey and Miss Harley again. Nothing. To Mrs. Archer's mind, would have been more undignified than to force oneself on the notice of a foreigner to whom one had happened to render an accidental service. But Mrs. Carfrey and her sister, to whom this point of view was unknown, and who would have found it utterly incomprehensible, felt themselves linked by an eternal gratitude to the delightful Americans. Who'd been so kind at Botson? With touching fidelity, they seized every chance of meeting Mrs. Archer and Janey in the course of their continental travels, and displayed a supernatural acuteness in finding out when they were to pass through London on their way to or from the States. The intimacy became indissoluble. And Mrs. Archer and Janey, whenever they alighted at Brown's Hotel, found themselves awaited by two affectionate friends, who, like themselves, cultivated ferns in Wardian cases, made macrame lace, read the memoirs of the Baroness Bunsen, and had views about the occupants of the leading London pulpits. As Mrs. Archer said, it made another thing of London to know Mrs. Carfrey and Miss Harley, and by the time that Newland had become engaged, the tie between the families was so firmly established that it was thought only right to send a wedding invitation to the two English ladies, who sent in return a pretty bouquet of pressed alpine flowers under glass. And on the dock, when Newland and his wife sailed for England, Mrs. Archer's last word had been, 
You must take May to see Mrs. Carfrey. Newland and his wife had no idea of obeying this injunction, but Mrs. Carfrey, with her usual acuteness, had run them down and sent them an invitation to dine, and it was over this invitation that May Archer was wrinkling her brows across the tea and muffins. It's all very well for you, Newland. You know them. But I shall feel so shy among a lot of people I've never met. And what shall I wear? Newland leaned back in his chair and smiled at her. She looked handsomer and more Diana-like than ever. The moist English air seemed to have deepened the bloom of her cheeks and softened the slight hardness of her virginal features. Or else it was simply the inner glow of happiness shining through her like a light under ice. Where, dearest? I thought a trunk full of things had come from Paris last week. Yes, of course. I meant to say that I shan't know which to wear. She pouted a little. I've never dined out in London. I don't want to be ridiculous. He tried to enter into her perplexity. But don't English women dress just like everybody else in the evening? Newland, how can you ask such funny questions when they go to the theater in old ball dresses and bare heads? Well, perhaps they wear new ball dresses at home, but at any rate Mrs. Carfrey and Miss Harley won't. They'll wear caps like my mother's and shawls, very soft shawls. Yes, but how will the other women be dressed? Not as well as you, dear, he rejoined, wondering what had suddenly developed in her Janie's morbid interest in clothes. She pushed back her chair with a sigh. That's dear of you, Newland, but it doesn't help me much. He had an inspiration. Why not wear your wedding dress? That can't be wrong, can it? Oh, dearest, if only I had it here. But it's gone to Paris to be made over for next winter, and Worth hasn't sent it back. Oh, well, said Archer, getting up. Look here, the fog's lifting. If we made a dash for the National Gallery, we might manage to catch a glimpse of the pictures. The Newland Archers were on their way home, after a three months wedding tour, which May, in writing to her girlfriends, vaguely summarized as blissful. They had not gone to the Italian lakes. On reflection, Archer had not been able to picture his wife in that particular setting. Her own inclination, after a month with the Paris dressmakers, was for mountaineering in July and swimming in August. This plan they punctually fulfilled, spending July at Interlaken and Grindelwald, and August at a little place called Etretat, on the Normandy coast, which someone had recommended as quaint and quiet. Once or twice, in the mountains, Archer had pointed southward and said, There's Italy. And May, her feet in a gentian bed, had smiled cheerfully and replied, It would be lovely to go there next winter, if only you didn't have to be in New York. But in reality... Traveling interested her even less than he had expected. She regarded it, once her clothes were ordered, as merely an enlarged opportunity for walking, riding, swimming, and trying her hand at the fascinating new game of lawn tennis. And when they finally got back to London, where they were to spend a fortnight while he ordered his clothes, she no longer concealed the eagerness with which she looked forward to sailing. In London, nothing interested her but the theatres and the shops. She found the theatres less exciting than the Paris Café Chantants, where, under the blossoming horse chestnuts of the Champs Elysees, she had had the novel experience of looking down from the restaurant terrace on an audience of cocottes and having her husband interpret to her as much of the songs as he thought suitable for bridal ears.
Archer had reverted to all his old inherited ideas about marriage. It was less trouble to conform with the tradition and treat May exactly as all his friends treated their wives than to try to put into practice the theories with which his untrammeled bachelorhood had dallied. There was no use in trying to emancipate a wife who had not the dimmest notion that she was not free. And he had long since discovered that May's only use of the liberty she supposed herself to possess would be to lay it on the altar of her wifely adoration. Her innate dignity would always keep her from making the gift abjectly. And a day might come, as it once had, when she would find the strength to take it altogether back if she thought she were doing it for his own good. But with a conception of marriage so uncomplicated and incurious as hers, such a crisis could be brought about only by something visibly outrageous in his own conduct, and the fineness of her feeling for him made that unthinkable. Whatever happened, he knew she would always be loyal, gallant, and unresentful, and that pledged him to the practice of the same virtues. All this tended to draw him back into his old habits of mind. If her simplicity had been the simplicity of pettiness, he would have chafed and rebelled. But since the lines of her character, though so few, were on the same fine mold as her face, she became the quiet tutelary divinity of all his old traditions and reverences. Such qualities were scarcely of the kind to enliven foreign travel, though they made her so easy and pleasant a companion. But he saw at once how they would fall into place in their proper setting. He had no fear of being oppressed by them, for his artistic, and intellectual life would go on, as it always had, outside the domestic circle. And within it, there would be nothing small and stifling. Coming back to his wife would never be like entering a stuffy room after a tramp in the open. And when they had children, the vacant corners in both their lives would be filled All these things went through his mind during their long, slow drive from Mayfair to South Kensington, where Mrs. Carfrey and her sister lived. Archer, too, would have preferred to escape their friend's hospitality. In conformity with the family tradition, he had always traveled as a sightseer and looker-on, affecting a haughty unconsciousness of the presence of his fellow beings. Once... Only, just after Harvard, he had spent a few gay weeks at Florence with a band of queer Europeanized Americans, dancing all night with titled ladies in palaces and gambling half the day with the rakes and dandies of the fashionable club. But it had all seemed to him, though the greatest fun in the world, as unreal as a carnival. These queer cosmopolitan women deep in complicated love affairs, which they appeared to feel the need for retailing to everyone they met, and the magnificent young officers, and the elderly dyed wits who were the subjects or the recipients of their confidences, were too different from the people Archer had grown up among, too much like expensive and rather malodorous hothouse exotics, to detain his imagination long. To introduce his wife into such society was out of the question, and in the course of his travels no other had shown any marked eagerness for his company. Not long after their arrival in London he had run across the Duke of St. Austrey, and the Duke, instantly and cordially recognizing him, said, "'Look me up, won't you?' But no proper-spirited American would have considered that a suggestion to be acted on, and the meeting was without a sequel. 
they had even managed to avoid May's English aunt, the banker's wife who was still in Yorkshire. In fact, they had purposely postponed going to London till the autumn, in order that their arrival during the season might not appear pushing and snobbish to these unknown relatives. Probably there'll be nobody at Mrs. Carfrey's. London's a desert at this season, and you've made yourself much too beautiful, Archer said to May, who sat at his side in the handsome, so spotlessly splendid in her sky-blue cloak, edged with swans down, that it seemed wicked to expose her to the London grime. I don't want them to think that we dress like savages, she replied, with a scorn that Pocahontas might have resented. And he was struck again by the religious reverence of even the most unworldly American women for the social advantages of dress. It's their armor, he thought, their defense against the unknown and their defiance of it. And he understood, for the first time, the earnestness with which May, who was incapable of tying a ribbon in her hair to charm, had gone through the solemn rite of selecting and ordering her extensive wardrobe. He had been right in expecting the party at Mrs. Carfrey's to be a small one. Besides their hostess and her sister, they found in the long, chilly drawing-room only another shawled lady, a genial vicar who was her husband, a silent lad, whom Mrs. Carfrey named as her nephew, and a small, dark gentleman with lively eyes whom she introduced as his tutor, pronouncing a French name as she did so. Into this dimly lit and dim-featured group, May Archer floated like a swan with the sunset on her. She seemed larger, fairer, more voluminously rustling than her husband had ever seen her, and he perceived that the rosiness and rustlingness were the tokens of an extreme and infantile shyness. What on earth will they expect me to talk about? Her helpless eyes implored him, at the very moment that her dazzling apparition was calling forth the same anxiety in their own bosoms. But beauty even when distrustful of itself, awakens confidence in the manly heart. And the vicar and the French name Tudor were soon manifesting to May their desire to put her at her ease. In spite of their best efforts, however, the dinner was a languishing affair. Archer noticed that his wife's way of showing herself at her ease with foreigners was to become more uncompromisingly local in her references— so that, though her loveliness was an encouragement to admiration, her conversation was a chill to repartee. The vicar soon abandoned the struggle, but the tutor, who spoke the most fluent and accomplished English, gallantly continued to pour it out to her until the ladies, to the manifest relief of all concerned, went up to the drawing-room. The vicar, after a glass of port, was obliged to hurry away to a meeting, and the shy nephew, who appeared to be an invalid, was packed off to bed. But Archer and the tutor continued to sit over their wine, and suddenly Archer found himself talking as he had not done since his last symposium with Ned Winsett. The car-free nephew, it turned out, had been threatened with consumption— and had had to leave Harrow for Switzerland, where he had spent two years in the milder air of Lake Leman. Being a bookish youth, he had been entrusted to Monsieur Riviere, who had brought him back to England, and was to remain with him until he went up to Oxford the following spring. And Monsieur Riviere added, with simplicity, that he should then have to look out for another job. It seemed impossible, Archer thought, that he should be long without one. So varied were his interests, and so many his gifts. He was a man of about thirty, with a thin, ugly face, May would certainly have called him common-looking, 
to which the play of his ideas gave an intense expressiveness. But there was nothing frivolous or cheap in his animation. His father, who had died young, had filled a small diplomatic post, and it had been intended that the son should follow the same career. But an insatiable taste for letters had thrown the young man into journalism and then into authorship, apparently unsuccessful, and at length, after other experiments and vicissitudes which he spared his listener, into tutoring English youths in Switzerland. Before that, however, he had lived much in Paris, frequented the Goncourt Grenier, been advised by Maupassant not to attempt to write. Even that seemed to Archer a dazzling honor, and had often talked with Merimee in his mother's house. He had obviously always been desperately poor and anxious, having a mother and an unmarried sister to provide for. And it was apparent that his literary ambitions had failed. His situation, in fact, seemed, materially speaking, no more brilliant than Ned Winsett's, but he had lived in a world in which, as he said, no one who loved ideas need hunger mentally. As it was precisely of that love that poor Winsett was starving to death, Archer looked with a sort of vicarious envy at this eager, impecunious young man who had fared so richly in his poverty. You see, monsieur, it's worth everything, isn't it, to keep one's intellectual liberty, not to enslave one's powers of appreciation, one's critical independence. It was because of that that I abandoned journalism and took to so much duller work, tutoring and private secretaryship. There is a good deal of drudgery, of course, but one preserves one's moral freedom, what we call in French one's quant à soi. And when one hears good talk, one can join in it without compromising any opinions but one's own, or one can listen and answer it inwardly. Ah, good conversation. There's nothing like it, is there? The air of ideas is the only air worth breathing. And so I have never regretted giving up either diplomacy or journalism, two different forms of the same self-abdication. He fixed his vivid eyes on Archer as he lit another cigarette. Voyez-vous, monsieur, to be able to look life in the face, that's worth living in a garret for, isn't it? But, after all, one must earn enough to pay for the garret, and I confess that to grow old as a private tutor or a private anything is almost as chilling to the imagination as a second secretaryship at Bucharest. Sometimes I feel I must make a plunge, an immense plunge. Do you suppose, for instance, there would be any opening for me in America, in New York? Archer looked at him with startled eyes. New York, for a young man who had frequented the Goncourt and Flaubert, and who thought the life of ideas the only one worth living. He continued to stare at Monsieur Riviere perplexedly, wondering how to tell him that his very superiorities and advantages would be the surest hindrance to success. New York, N New York, but must it be especially New York, he stammered, utterly unable to imagine what lucrative opening his native city could offer to a young man to whom good conversation appeared to be the only necessity. A sudden flush rose under Monsieur Riviere's sallow skin. I thought it your metropolis. Is it not the intellectual life more active there, he rejoined? And then, as if fearing to give his hearer the impression of having asked a favor, he went on hastily. One throws out random suggestions, more to oneself than to others. In reality, I see no immediate prospect. And rising from his seat, he added without a trace of constraint, But Mrs. Carfrey will think that I ought to be taking you upstairs. During the homeward drive, Archer pondered deeply on this episode. 
His hour with Monsieur Riviere had put new air into his lungs, and his first impulse had been to invite him to dine the next day. But he was beginning to understand why married men did not always immediately yield to their first impulses. That young tutor is an interesting fellow. We had some awfully good talk after dinner about books and things. He threw out tentatively in the hansom. May roused herself from one of the dreamy silences into which he had read so many meanings before six months of marriage had given him the key to them. The little Frenchman. Wasn't he dreadfully common? she questioned coldly. And he guessed that she nursed a secret disappointment at having been invited out in London to meet a clergyman and a French tutor. The disappointment was not occasioned by the sentiment ordinarily defined as snobbishness, but by old New York's sense of what was due to it when it risked its dignity on foreign lands. If May's parents had entertained the Carfries in Fifth Avenue, they would have offered them something more substantial than a parson and a schoolmaster. But Archer was on edge and took her up. Common? Common where? he queried. And she returned with unusual readiness. Why, I should say anywhere but in his schoolroom. Those people are always awkward in society. But then, she added disarmingly, I suppose I shouldn't have known if he was clever. Archer disliked her use of the word clever almost as much as her use of the word common. But he was beginning to fear his tendency to dwell on the things he disliked in her. After all, her point of view had always been the same. It was that of all the people he had grown up among, and he had always regarded it as necessary but negligible. Until a few months ago he had never known a nice woman who looked at life differently, and if a man married, it must necessarily be among the nice. Ah, then I won't ask him to dine, he concluded with a laugh. And May echoed, bewildered, Goodness! Ask the Carfrey's tutor? Well, not on the same day with the Carfrey's, if you prefer, I shouldn't. But I did rather want another talk with him. He's looking for a job in New York. Her surprise increased with her indifference. He almost fancied that she suspected him of being tainted with foreignness. A job in New York? What sort of a job? People don't have French tutors. What does he want to do? Chiefly to enjoy good conversation, I understand. Her husband retorted perversely, and she broke into an appreciative laugh. Oh, Newland, how funny! Isn't that French? On the whole, he was glad to have the matter settled for him by her refusing to take seriously his wish to invite Monsieur Riviere. Another after-dinner talk would have made it difficult to avoid the question of New York, and the more Archer considered it, the less he was able to fit Monsieur Riviere into any conceivable picture of New York as he knew it. He perceived, with a flash of chilling insight, that in future many problems would be thus negatively solved for him. But as he paid the handsome and followed his wife's long train into the house, he took refuge in the comforting platitude that the first six months were always the most difficult in marriage. After that, I suppose we shall have pretty nearly finished rubbing off each other's angles, he reflected. But the worst of it was that May's pressure was already bearing on the very angles whose sharpness he most wanted to keep. End of chapter 20